Here's a riveting piece of scripture. Now Moses said to Hobab, the son of Ruel, the Midianite, we're setting out for the place which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us. Hmm. And we will treat you well. For the Lord has promised good things to Israel. Mm. Hobab said to him, No, I I won't go. I'll depart to my own land and to my relatives. So Moses said, Please. Love that. Please. Don't leave. Inasmuch as you know how we are to camp in the wilderness, you can be our eyes. And this is what will happen. If you go with us, indeed it shall be that whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same we will do to you. Isn't that a great piece of scripture? Israel has been at Sinai for a year. They're in the middle of the wilderness. Deuteronomy calls it a howling desert. Here they are for a year. They're getting ready to go to the promised land. He says to an outsider, one of the non-elect, a Midianite, one of Abraham's children, it's true, but still not rejected as part of the elect. He said, come with us because we're going to a place that God promised he would give us. And anything good that comes to us, we'll share with you. He said, I don't think so. And Moses said, please, come with us. You've got things to contribute. And it will be, and it will be, that whatever good God does to us, we'll do to you. This is a word of assurance But I'll tell you what really rings my bell about the text is, it's where he speaks this. He's not talking in Acapulco. They've been here for a solid year. The desert's right out in front of them. And he says, we're going to a place that God has promised. We're going to get it. And we would like you to go with us not because we're superior or anything like that at all. God has promised these things to us. And we'd love to share them with you. Now, evangelism and all of that, you pour all of that in there. What's really great about this is where he is when he promises it. I I know we tend to think, When things are going well, when church numbers are up, for example, or or church attendance is great, or or the money, we're all doing well, and the money in our programs are working well, we feel like God's healthy. And and what he's doing is going well. When the times get a bit harder, we tend to check on God's health. I, I know that's right, you see. And we not only do it personally, we do it congregationally. But this fella is in the middle of trouble. He's in the middle of trouble. And he's talking like it's a done deal. And so it is. And it's a done deal because God is not only faithful, but he has enabled these people. You remember that burning bush business? It's a great metaphor for Israel. While while Moses is looking at it, this is Exodus 3. You know the text. uh, you, You know the text. Here, here Moses is looking at the burning bush, and it's a great metaphor for God himself, you see, because he doesn't need the bush. The bush is burning, but it's not consumed, and God is dwelling in it. He doesn't need to feed on this bush so that when, when the fire, who is God in there, burns it all up, then the fire will die. He doesn't need the bush, and he doesn't need to be sustained. This bush is a great metaphor for the Lord God who is self-sufficient and needs no one else. That is, there's nothing in him that that has to have anything else. Nevertheless, he wants us. And it's a great metaphor for Israel. 
400 years plus they've been there, a couple and a half centuries under the beatings they were taking, and still there they were. It's a great metaphor for a people who can take a bad beating for a prolonged time and still be there. But the reason they could still be there is because God dwelled in the midst of them. And that's what sustains a people. That's what sustains an individual. It's what sustains a church. It's what sustains anything there is. For only in him do all things continue to exist. Certainly Israel and Moses with his trust in the Lord. So he's assured it's a done deal. Come with us and we will do you good. But still, Moses isn't stupid either. He knows who he's talking about. These are the people who wouldn't have him in the first place. Who made you a judge over us? Over us? One of them said representatively. Who made you a boss over us? And off he ran, as you remember. And he's embittered while he's away in, uh, in Midian because he won't, call his, he won't circumcise his child. Calls him alien and won't circumcise him. And God almost kills the child later because he wouldn't circumcise the boy. He wouldn't give God his firstborn. And here's this fellow walking into Egypt saying to Pharaoh, Israel's my firstborn, give me him or I'll kill you. And here he's walking in. He hasn't circumcised his own boy. And God makes it clear to him, what I'm asking from Pharaoh, I'm asking from you. And so Moses knows who he's dealing with. He knows his own heart. He knows his own limitations. He knows these people have had made the golden calf. He knows all of that stuff. He goes to God every now and again and says, you're breaking my back. You're putting all these people on top of me and I can't handle them. So he knows all of that. And now they're leaving Sinai. And he says, we're going home. Mm -hmm. And somebody might have whispered to him, you know who, somebody might have whispered to him, how can you talk that way? Everything's against you. Look at it. You're welcome to this people, this group, this group. Look at, look at this place. You'll get buried here. He said, we've been in worse places. We used to be in Egypt. Yeah, but that's out of the frying pan, into the fire. He said, wait around. We're heading for home. And he's confident of it. So confident. Not in his own power. Not in their power. Not because Hobab would know where to camp. Because he knows that the Lord God made a promise. And God isn't the kind to break his promises. Later on, later on, some will, will say a, a, a mosaic figure called Paul. In Second Corinthians 1 will say, all God's promises are in Jesus Christ. And they're what? Yes, all God's promises in Jesus Christ are yes. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. When God makes a promise, he gets it done. Now, those of us who don't want it, those of us who want to walk away, that we can do, but the promise is going to be fulfilled. There's going to be a human family one of these days in glory. There's going to be a human family all looking at one another, happy to see one another. Oh, you made it. I met you back in so-and-so. You made it. Was it worth all the trouble? And you'll say, they'll say, what trouble? Jeremiah Johnson, right? Amen. What trouble, he says. So, so here it is. This is Israel. It's not within them to take themselves through the wilderness. He will take them through. And here you are. He didn't choose you in the Lord Jesus Christ because you were stronger than anybody else. Not because you were wealthier than anybody else. Not because you were morally better than anyone else. What is it he said in Ephesians 2? You were, and you, you have to read the word dead, not flat, soulless tone. You were, and I can't do it, I've had a good big voice, I could. You were dead. We were dead in our trespasses. And that's when he called us. So we're not depending on one another. That needs qualified. We are depending on one another in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what I mean. Your grown people qualify where it needs to be qualified. We can't depend on one another. We can't depend on the church unless it is the Lord God who is sovereignly acting within the body of Christ and sustaining us. And then we can look at one another and lean on one another as we should. But we are equipped because God is with us to get us through the wilderness. 
I heard this. I, I don't know if it's a true story or not. You, you judge for yourself. It's about two camels. They're, they're talking camels, but uh, I, don't know if it's a true, I, don't, I don't know if it's a true story or not. But, but the son camel says to the father camel, you know, and I haven't dressed up in boots like this since I was a kid. I, I thought I was getting time to get all dolled up to, to come here. And I'm, I'm in boots not even laced up. I'm just noticing my big feet. That, that's why I mentioned it. He said, he said to his father, uh, look, look at my big feet, he said. They're all padded and bouncy and all of that. What, what, what's the story about those? And the father said, well, see, in the, in the, in the sandy desert, horses, they can't walk in it. They got those wee skinny hoops, and they go down into it, but not us. We've got these big spongy jobs, you see. We just ply all the way through it. And the kid said, that is brilliant. He said, you know what I've noticed, too? He said, my eyelids, they're, they're like suitcases. And I've got these big eyelashes. And when I close them, I, I can't see anything. What's the story in those? He said, well, you see... In the desert, in the wild desert, there are these Samoom winds, and they pick up the sand, and they fly that thing sometimes at 55, 60 miles an hour, and horses, they can't do it. Donkeys, it won't work for them. But us, we're fully equipped for all of that. And he said, bless me. Isn't that great? And he said, and and look at my back. Look at the humps on me. He said, look at those big humps. What's the story on them? He said... He said, horses, they can't carry food. See all of those things? We pack all the food in there, and we can go for weeks and not eat a scrap because those deserts, there's nothing to eat there. But, so we're well built for the desert. And the kid says, that, that, that is great. He said, what are we doing in the San Diego Zoo? <laughs> listen, listen, listen. If there's a wilderness... If there's a wilderness to be got through, if there's a wilderness to be got through, and if there's anybody equipped to get through it, we are it. Not because we are we, end of story, but because we are we in the Christ. We are the people in whom God dwells. And we do live in the wilderness. We do know about cancer. We do know about broken marriages. We do know about lost children. We do know about kids that have gone off and hurt themselves and hurt their family. We do know of parents who deserted children. We do know of economic crises when, when businesses are lost and homes are lost and people are worried sick. We know all about that. We don't need lectures about how tough life is. We've been through it. We buried our own for pity's sake. We've watched them in the hospices and in the hospitals. We've watched the doctors screw things up. We've watched people die in loneliness. We've watched our, some of our own children, or at least the children of those we love more than we love ourselves, going through awful time. Quit preaching, we would say to the world. Quit preaching to the church as if we didn't know. We know all about it. Oh, but we know who's with us. And we'll get through the wilderness. And that's all there is about it. Because God is faithful. And in that book of Romans chapter 1, well, 1 through 17, he introduces, it says, he's, I'm, I'm Paul, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, separated, listen to this, separated under the gospel of God, not Jesus, true, but not there. The gospel of God, which he promised. Mm, Promise? What is it you do when you promise? You take a piece of the future, and whatever else will happen, this, this piece, I've carved it out, and that's what's going to happen. And God promised in the gospel through the prophets, in the Holy Scriptures, and it's all concerning his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know how the rest of that text goes. And so he said in 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's God's power to save all that believe. You know how the rest of that text goes. And then he concludes saying um, that in it, here's, here's why it's the power of God to save. Here's why it's the power of God to save in that text. Because in it, 
God's righteousness is unveiled. That's it. Dakosune feyu means God doing right by keeping his word. God is faithful. When he says he'll do it, he does it. And so then in 118 of Romans, all the way through 32, 118 to 32, he says, write this across the Gentile world. Faithless. And that's us. From Adam to Moses, so to speak. He does the same in 5.12 through 21. But from Adam to Moses, right across it, faithless. And then he turns to the Jews. And there's a bit of a debate about this, but shelving all of that. 2.1 to 3.19. Right across the whole Jewish world, faithless. And then he sum, it sums it all up in 3.20, saying this. All of that. Now, we know that whatsoever things the law saith, is 3.19. It says to those that are under the law, that, verse 20, and he alludes to Psalm 143, that the whole world may be brought under judgment and every mouth stopped. What do you write across our human family's history? Faithless. And that's what 320 says. And then comes 321. But now... mm, We can't get back there. We can't get back to the days when the the news of Jesus was just brand new, where people jumped up in the morning realizing he's come, and their eyes got all big like organ stops, and they went all over the place telling it to all their friends and, and their families and the like. He has come. We can't get back to that emotional thing, and I understand that. But nevertheless, we've got the story, don't we? Uh, we haven't seen him, but we love him. Though now we see him not, yet we believe and trust in him and we're filled with joy unspeakable, full of glory. This is the gospel. And 321 says, but now, now, never mind what the versions say. The text says, but now God's righteousness is revealed apart from the Torah, the Jewish law, apart from the Torah, but witnessed to by the Torah and the prophets. And what is that? That God justifies us, God saves us, God does all that good stuff, all, all those little words. And he says he does it, and here's what's important. He does it by, so said the versions, by faith in Jesus. It's a subjective genitive. I like to say that. It makes me sound scholarly, don't you see? It's, it's a subjective genitive. It's diopistus, and it's, Christu, it means it's Christ's faith. It's not faith in Christ. That's true in other texts. Listen, listen. Forget all I said there. Forget all of that. Just hear this. In 322, he says, God justifies us, does all its right by us and all of that. And he does it by the faith, the faithfulness, the integrity of Jesus Christ. Uh Uh-huh. That's... That's the bottom line for you and me. We have nothing to plead. We come before and we say, look, with nothing in our hands we bring, simply to your cross we cling. There's the story. That's your story and my story. And it's the assurance that God is faithful that leads Moses to say to Hobab, we're going. How about sharing with us? We'd love you. He's not wanting, he's not wanting, um, he's not wanting more people for God He's wanting to tell about God who is for more people. See, see, I, here, here's what I think. I think, maybe I don't think this. Maybe I sometimes think this. I, I think I mostly think this. I, I, I think that we tend, we tend to try to get more people for God and, you know, we grunt and sweat about it. I, I think our story is that God is for more people. And, and if we present a God who not only loves the church, but who loves the church and creates the church so that the church can bear witness that he loves the entire human family. And Moses' offer here is to one of the non-elect, share the blessings that God has uh, promised us and will fulfill. Uh, to us. I, I, I think we need to be doing that. 3.16 says, 
3.16 says, for God, mm, it's 20 to 8. Is that 20 to 8? Uh, well, uh, it's 20 to 8. You thought it was 10 o'clock, didn't you? No, uh, 20 to 8, and I'm close to being done. Uh, and, and, and three, and, and three, what? Oh, well. Ooh. Oh, see, I love this. Uh, I, I, I do. Honestly, I do. And, and somebody says, well, he loves it because he's up talking. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. I, no, no, I, I, I love church. I, I do. I love it. And, and uh, I, I think we sound very noble and all. I'm not very noble. But I, I can't help saying I love our being together this way. I love this singing. What, what happens? Do people come up from the south and learn how to sing up here? <laughs> they, we, we were down at uh, wherever we were down at, where the, the Boswell uh, family lives in that. And down at church, uh, wherever. Fairbanks, Fairbanks. Uh, are up, are up, up, up in Fairbanks. And I'm telling you, uh, the, the singing was fabulous. And... Yeah, you people here can sing a bit, I'll tell you. So I, I love church, and it's not just that, oh, isn't he a lovely man? No, I'm not. I'm not a lovely man, but I love church. And, of course, the reason you would expect of me, and I feel this way, it's the Christ at the heart of it. It's the Holy Spirit who makes his presence uh, concrete there. And it's the Holy Father who's above all, through all, and is all, who purposed the whole thing. And we're in great shape here. And I don't know what I was talking about before I started saying that. <laughs> what, do you know what I was talking about? What was I saying? Uh, Ho- and what about him? Bringing, that God, God wants more that, that's what I was saying. That's what I was saying. I was saying, I was saying, it's not our business to go out and get more people for God, though that's true. Our business is to go out and tell people, God wants more. That, that's it. Oh, and now I remember John 3.16. I've forgotten that. John 3. John, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be this, this flighty and all of that. I, um, I wasn't really ready when I got here, to tell you the truth. And after that meal, I, I can hardly stay on the floor. Um, and John 3.16 it says, for God so love the world, and you know how the rest of that goes. He doesn't want anybody to perish. And then he says in 3.17, because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. Why not? Because we had done a perfectly good job of it all by ourselves. We didn't need any help for that. What we needed was rescue. He needed to bring us out of our trouble. He needed to take care of all the powers that we couldn't handle. Need us, needed him to bring us out of the wilderness and bring us home. And that's why we love him. He, we love him because he first loved us. Somebody says, well, that's what he said to Job. You know, that's what Satan said. Well, Job loved him because he loved him. It was all rubbish. It's true that, that his love for us provoked our love in him, but that's not to say our love isn't genuine. Look, look, you know you're a sinner, and I know I'm a sinner for pity's sake. And there are a lot of other people who know I'm a sinner. But we know we're sinners. Is there, any, is there anybody that doesn't know that? But, but can you deny that you love him? Can, can you say, no, I don't care about him. Some of you say, well, write that down there. I do not love God. Sign your name to that. Would you sign it? Never. Not in the worst state you were in. You know you love him. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to rescue us. And that's the whole story. And this one who comes to rescue us is capable of doing it. Moses wasn't talking about a God who had nice feelings, you know, and, and thought, well, I'd love to do that for them. Wish I could do it. No, sir. This one is capable of doing it. And when we preach the gospel, and we say, in Romans 10, 9, another text, uh, particularly Philippians 2, Jesus is Lord. We're not inviting people to believe it. We're not saying, Jesus is Lord, if you take him into your heart. We are announcing that Jesus is Lord, whether anybody likes it or not. For Jesus is Lord. We don't make him Lord. We acknowledge he's Lord. We don't put him on the throne. He's already on the throne. 
And if people don't want him, and we want people to want him, and we want us to want him, but if they want him or don't want him, he is what he is. Lifted him up, set him at his own right hand, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the world to come, not just down in the parks, in the wildernesses. For God is the Lord of wilderness. God is the Lord of cancer. God is the Lord of all the disease that leads up to the dying. And God is the Lord of dying. Oh, and that's who he is, and that's who we trust. And that's what we preach. And it's what we sing. It's what we sing. Don't we sing great when we sing those things? Whether we sound well or not, it's a secondary issue. But you sound well, you understand. But whether we sound well or not, we know what we're singing. It's the substance. It's the heart. We pray it. You say the name, a 12-year-old. He's a brand new Christian. He's up to lead his first prayer. And what's he feeling? Huh? He's all nervous, isn't he? And he starts to pray, and he's got that, Lord, you know, and he's all wavering in his voice, you know, because he's scared. When he's done with the prayer, what does he say? In the name of our Lord Jesus. And as soon as he says that, if you listen really hard, shh, 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 shh. Hear it? A dragon way somewhere, squealing. Fear and agony, a 12-year-old boy, names the name of Jesus Christ, and the whole satanic kingdom starts shaking. And the dragon screams in agony, knowing his day is coming. This is what we announce. This is what we pray. And on Sundays, it's what we eat. And it's what we drink. And we, and we, we, we take seriously all the problems, our own inner ugliness that we, oh, I'd love to be through with this. And our sins, uh, we defy them, don't you see, when we sing. We defy them when we pray. We defy them when we eat and drink. Not just new sins, old sins. Not just weak sins, strong sins. Not just, not just the kind that you can tick off with your jacket. No, invincible sins. We say, when we eat and drink, he's Lord. Lord of the whole thing. Took care of the sin issue. I don't need to be worrying about it anymore. Hmm. This is the God who promised. This is the God that uh, Moses speaks about. And this is the God who's sure. It's quarter to eight. I'm nearly done. This is the God that Moses spoke about. And the good news is that when he speaks in Jesus Christ, he will say, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Same old God. Not a new one. The old one, the one who's always been there, the one who made all the promises, the one who saw them through their lives, and as he saw them through their lives and saw Israel through into the promised land, whether they were faithless or not, and when they got, they got really bad, he said, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a what? A new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of, he wasn't talking to them when they were all smiling and, and obedient and, and loving them and all the rest of it. He spoke to them when they were wicked faithless and ungodly, and instead of saying, I'm going to wash my hands of you. No. He said, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. And you know how that text goes. And then one night, 600 years or something like it, 600 years later, a young carpenter fella passes a cup around and said, that's my blood of the new covenant. 600 years we waited. Thought he had forgotten about the whole thing. (laughs) Hadn't forgotten. You're now looking at the new covenant. And then what does he do? He sings a song on his way to... What? He sings Psalm 118 on the way to Golgotha, the trials and then Golgotha. Did he believe in the Father? He believed in the Holy Father. And on the cross he says, Father, into your hands I commit my entire life. Left on the cross, the father letting them do all that they did, his own nation rejecting him, people sneering at him, his friends run off, God help them, all of that going on, and here he is, saying to his father, I trust you. And Peter, putting the words of David in his mouth, I beheld the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand, I'll not be moved. Cancer? Going to move us? It won't, will it? What, 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 what will move us? What will make us leave? 
Well, we'll make us say, well, he started the job, but he won't finish it. If there's a Hobab anywhere, we'd say to him or her, if Hobab will work for a woman. But anyway, we would say to any of them, God has promised us there's a day coming. There will be um, a day of resurrection. And the glory of it all, way beyond our imagining. And we would love you to come with us. And here's what we've got. And we'd, we'd unpack the story of it and tell it about him. And let him then do the rest with these people. And we will say this. He's faithful and it'll be done. Here's the last thing I'm saying. Frank Borum, it'll take me about five minutes to say it. Frank Borum, born in Tunbridge, Wells, England, something like 40 miles from London. He was a preacher fellow. He went to New Zealand first, and then he went to Melbourne where my sister lived. I baptized her into Christ uh, six months before she died. Thank God. Yeah, I'm wonderful. Um, so what was I saying? Frank Borum went to Melbourne, and um, uh, he and his friends, when they went for a walk, they didn't walk just around the corner. They'd walk for days, you see. And they, and they decided to go north, or I can't remember, north instead of south as they normally went, but this was the direction they never went. They walked for hours and hours and hours. And as they were walking and seeing ordinary things, you know, a big fancy car with big fancy people in it. I like fancy cars and Big fancy people. So I'm not criticizing them. But here a big fancy car and big fancy people flew by them with half the speed of light, but not so fast where the women couldn't look out. And, you know, it always has to be a woman who's got sympathy. Oh, look at them. They're walking and we are driving, you see. So they flew up the road and a couple of minutes later, it flew back at the speed of light and the, and the women were, no doubt the women, were looking out the window. Oh, poor things, you know. And the group thought, what was all that about? They walked for about another half an hour, and then they realized what it was all about. The road ended with a big fence. It was a dead end. <laughs> and I like, to imagine, I like to imagine that fancy group going back to their house, sitting down at a big fancy table with their 15 knives, 14 forks, and a dozen spoons, eating their fish paste, and, 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 having an, and all having a nice talk, and then going to the drawing room afterward, and some woman saying, I, I feel so sorry for those poor people. At least we were driving, and those poor things walked. So it, it must have been tough on them. But her, but her sympathy would have been lost on them, because they got to the end of the road, and there's this big fence, and they wouldn't have it. They climbed the fence. He said, Borum says, we went up a hill for several hundred yards under a lot of trees, and we come out on the crest of the hill. And he says, down there before us lay paradise. He said, it was utterly and absolutely glorious. He said, I took it all in. He said, the sky was never bluer. The clouds never fluffier. Birds were going lunatic with their acrobatics. It was beautiful. He said, the whole place was a mass of flowers, multicolors here, there, and everywhere. And away down below was this winding, uh, it looked like glass, only you saw the trees that were along the banks dipping into it and showed that it was alive. He said, and that wasn't enough. Here comes this bird, and I've lost the name of the bird. It's blue. Linda, what's the name of that bird? A kingfisher, thank you. A kingfisher. Now, not all kingfishers are the same color, I'm told. I've seen a few, but nothing like this one. He said it was nut brown head, all blue and, and lovely colored and all of that. And he landed on a bush near us, and he said he looked at us like, what are you doing in my domain? And then he started this, you know, this business. Take a look. Have you ever seen anything like this? You know what? And then he gives them the whole, the whole full show. He said, there was no, he said, I've seen nothing like it. I love that story. Borum would say to you and me, oh, don't let the obstacles, don't let the difficulties 
I, 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 look, I don't want to be clear, but I know some of you are hurting here. I know, I, I know some of you are very ill, and I, I do, honest to God, I do. And I don't want to sound glib, but there isn't any point of us kidding ourselves. Jesus is Lord, and you and I, if we're in the Christ indeed, we're his people. And if he speaks the truth, if he is faithful as we know he is, he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. And then he says, you're looking at the truth. All of that, all of that we know, all of that we sing, and all of that we pray, all of that we read, and all of that we preach. So somewhere, somewhere down the line, we're going to have to say, it's going to be okay. And we, and we do, and we will. So, no matter what the obstacles are, no matter how tough it is, yeah, do all your crying. I do my own little bit. My Ethel died in uh, Easter Sunday, 209. Uh, and so coming up on Easter Sunday, um, she'll be two years dead. And every now and again, I'm absolutely unzipped. You know what I mean? I just, uh, you know. But aren't you the people who say it's going to get better? Aren't you the people who say it's going to be all right one of these days? See, that's what I need to hear. And that's what I need to hear you sing. And that's what we all need to hear. Sing to one another and speak to one another and story to one another. This is our business to speak the gospel. So no matter what the obstacles are, climb them. Over on the other side of the obstacle, up a little hill, under the tree, and out there one of these days, our eyes will open. Ah, paradise. That's good news, isn't it? Yeah, it is. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be merciful unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you.